Welcome to this first ACAN Australia event uh, for 2024. And my name is Dr. Peter Raisbeck, and the name of this event is um, Concrete Eulogies, which is a little bit of a discussion around issues to do with um, embodied carbon and concrete. And of course, the M Pavilion. <clears throat> so, first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded land on which we work learn and live where, where, wherever we might be, um, where I am, the land of the Wurundjeri, Wurrung and Bunurong peoples. We recognise the unique place held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent with histories of continuous connection dating back more than 60,000 years. We acknowledge their enduring cultural practices of caring for country and we pay respect to elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge both in the academy and in our um, profession of architecture and in the built environment. <clears throat> so firstly, I'd like to introduce yourself, myself, I'd like to introduce you to the speakers and then we'll get um, started. Um, firstly, we have Charity Edwards, who is a lecturer in architecture and urban planning and design at Monash University, where she oversees the Bachelor of Architecture Design Studios, alongside also teaching urban history and theory units at both undergraduate and master's level. She is a practicing architect with over 20 years experience across Australia and Asia and continues to collaborate with artists, scientists and communities to create built spaces, objects and landscapes. Then we have the wonderful Virginia Mannering, who is an educational fellow in architectural design at the Melbourne School of Design at the University of Melbourne. Her PhD examines the histories and legacies of earth moving and earth making in the settler colonial city. And we're also welcome to have also from Monash, Jason Crow, who is a senior lecturer at Monash University and a licensed architect in the state of Pennsylvania. Jason's research explores how technological changes impact material ontologies and artisanal epistemologies. He was a research fellow at the Canadian Centre for Architecture and an Arthur C. Tagg fellow at McGill University, where he completed his PhD dissertation examining the influence of material culture on the origins of Gothic architecture. Jason's monograph, A New Material Interpretation of 20th Century Architecture, Reconstructing the Abbey of St. Denis, I hope I've got that pronunciation partly right, Jason, will be, reduced, will be released in June of this year as part of Amsterdam University Press's, Amsterdam University Press's Knowledge Communities Series. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen and kick off with a short introduction. And... Um, we will run through this. So this wonderful um, image uh, by John Goings is of the M Pavilion and at ACAN earlier this year, we're beginning to discuss um, the M Pavilion and the fact that it was completely constructed by concrete. So we kind of wondered just how much embodied carbon was in this um, folly. And we did a calculation using the um, EPIC database, a database that gives you figures for particular materials in relation to both embodied carbon, but also in relation to um, the amount of embodied water that might have been used in the production of this building. We went out there and we measured it up and we had a look at um, some images on Google Earth and we conservatively estimated that there are 116 metric tonnes of embodied carbon were produced 
in the making of this particular uh, building. And that in addition, there was um, not quite an Olympic-sized swimming pool, but there were 376,497 litres of water expended in the production of this particular building. And I'm thankful for um, uh, Gracie and uh, Rob Polglaze for helping me run through these um, calculations. So all of that in terms of embodied carbon by way of comparison, and I think these kinds of um, accounting comparisons or, or carbon accounting comparisons are important when we begin to tease out the issues around um, carbon emissions and embodied carbon in the built environment is two typical Australian homes. 5,850 trees and 43 flights from Melbourne to London. I guess that's probably 20, 21 and a half return flights, but that gives you an idea of it. I guess I was kind of interested in thinking about um, what the purpose of this particular um, folly was. And there's a couple of quotes there um, in the M Pavilion Education Guide from uh, the architect of the Pavilion, Tadeo Ando, which seems to make reference to um, issues around um, eternity and the idea that it's something that will continue to live in people's hearts and the idea that <clears throat> meaning is created through the elements of nature, light and air and indications of the passing of time and the changing of um, seasons. Now, I've got a little bit of a problem here, Leonie, because I need to see the entire um, screen. But unfortunately, I can't. There we go. Let's try this again. And so, <clears throat> inspired by Ando's um, discussions, I thought, what better thing to do in regards to introduce some of the issues in regards to this particular building is to do a poem. And um, I decided to call this poem, Ando, You're a Rando. And I'm quite interested in the work of the German poet, Rainer Maria Rilke. And I was kind of called it a new Juno elegy for those of you who are interested in that. The poem is actually a shape poem, um, which in fact, there is a tradition in poetry of um, shape poems, otherwise known as concrete poems. So I thought that was kind of amusing when it was pointed out to me. And you can see here, I've formed it into the shape of a panel with a sort of gap in the middle. So I'll try and read it out for you and you'll get a sort of flavour of some of the things that I think this um, pavilion urges us to discuss. <clears throat> Ando, you're a rando, pumping down our at atomistic ectoplasm and plopping concrete on the QV gardens, squeezing us into each little biscuit panel, spinctering our carbon dioxide, lapping up the water, then fiddling with little ribbons for eyes as the world burns up eternal and organic. Yes, a bit of fly ash for the conscience. 116 tonnes of aero, aero, aerosolic car, car, carbon. 376,000 litres of water. All the nutritional information hidden. A zillion eyes caressing our surfaces. Our odour cool and ashen from scorched embers of lime kilns, our damp skin dappled in lovely forever reflections. An eternal epidermis, unpolished and itchy from acute pliform lesions. Scarified marks are making in an Insta Meta Google ready SEO prosthetic for the philanthropists, benevolence bowing down to the warm vapours evaporating and reverberating in the sun. Reverberating in the sun. Reverberating in the sun. Shrinking in the night. A slow slumber. And like the angels, we are terrifying. And we will sing to the ancients our blood water and carbon shit and methane snot 
through a cruel, brutalist geometry, squeezing out to sing your eternity song, Ando, singing your water tranquility and then vanish in concrete, becoming a godlike geology without morals. Thank you so much. And um, probably best to have a, you know, think about some of the images, but we might uh, move right along after that. And I think I will hand it over to our first speaker, Charity. So thank you, Charity. Um, and I'm just going to start with something that's not precisely about Ando or cruel god geologies, um, but something a little bit about the colour of concrete and thinking about colour and concrete. So the ubiquity of pale concrete goes beyond any structural purpose and sits, I think, particularly awkwardly amongst recent discussions of decolonising contemporary architecture. This is an increasingly singular aesthetic the stark absence of colour, the bleaching out of aggregates and other additives, and the smoothing out of texture. So while the structural advantages of concrete are undeniable, the popularity of this material manifests in these conditions raises questions that extend beyond mere function. I'd like to argue that the prevalence of pale concrete reflects a deeper cultural bias, that of a Western chromophobia, and there I'm quoting the artist David Batchelor, he talks about where colour is associated with chaos and disorder and contrasting with the valorised whiteness that symbolises purity and order. And tonight I want to examine how this cultural anxiety manifests in the built environment and also whether the dominance of how concrete aligns with or challenges ongoing discussions of decolonising contemporary architecture. So for David Batchelor, uh, Chromophobia, his essayistic short novel here, and he argues that Western cultures hold a deep-seated fear of colour. And this aversion stems from long historical associations of colour with the feminine, the emotional and the unruly. And conversely, white is positioned as the ideal, representing a sanitised form of modernity, order and control. And this binary can also be readily observed in the realm of architecture and our cities more generally. How concrete facades are readily uh, represented as offering a sense of neutrality, a blank canvas and upon which human experience unfolds. But this supposed neutrality is not objective. It perpetuates specific cultural values that privilege a sanitized aesthetic over the richness and vibrancy of color, texture and difference. So the privileging in white, of whiteness in architecture extends beyond aesthetics as well. The construction industry often utilizes high albedo white cement, which reflects sunlight and contributes to a building's energy efficiency. Uh, the environmental benefit, however, comes at a cost. The production of white cement generates waste that cannot easily be recycled and highlights this inherent contradiction. A material chosen for its supposed environmental benefits creates yet more environmental burdens during its production. This contradiction serves as a microcosm, I think, of the broader issues, the privileging of a specific aesthetic, even when it comes at a cost that undermines the values it claims to uphold. And I've got to note that this image used to select this bit is precisely here for Virginia's benefit because it's in Canberra. Um, decolonizing contemporary architecture goes beyond dismantling the physical structures of colonialism. It also requires a critical evaluation of the cultural assumptions and biases embedded within the processes we design architecture with. And at first glance, it's easy to see how the dominance of power concrete reflects a certain Eurocentric preoccupation with order and control, which potentially silences the aesthetic practices and cultural narratives of marginalised communities within its orbit. And at the very least, this lack of colour diversity homogenises our built environment, failing to reflect again the richness and the specificity of experiences around the planet. You see this in Hong Kong um, here, yeah, where it's like important to acknowledge that concrete itself is not inherently problematic in this regard. And that historically concrete has been employed in ways that celebrate colour and texture. Uh, much brutalist architecture, for example, uh, embraces the raw, unfinished state of concrete 
and allows variations in color to come forth. And architects like Francis Carey and Marian Kamara of Atelier Masomi are creating new ground in concrete construction, utilizing locally sourced pigments and innovative casting techniques to design buildings that celebrate the material's very real hybridity, versatility, and geographic specificity. And these examples demonstrate a potential for concrete perhaps to be a kind of culturally inclusive material that absorbs the earth and minerals from its milieu and moves beyond the limitations of the monochrome. Uh, architects can clearly engage in a more critical dialogue around materials and in particular about the cultural baggage associated with colour choices in architecture. Even just embracing a wider colour spectrum presents an opportunity to create structures that are more responsive to their local context and celebrate the diversities of communities they inhabit. And in this way, we might better imagine buildings that incorporate locally sourced pigments reflecting their local spectrum in their own territory. And we could also create spaces that tell stories through their entangled material choices, ongoing narratives that reference cultural practices, ecological conditions, and historically marginalized experience. And we don't even have to imagine very hard because we already have those precedents that have manifest through the colonial project around the planet. Forms of rammed earth construction were used across Australia in the early 20th century. And again, following material shortages in World War I and World War II. And in the Americas, France and England too, since the late 18th century, in times of economic decline or material shortage, Versions of earth construction were used to create buildings that merged local materials and environmental conditions with colonial ambition. Not always successful, you can think of flooding, humidity, and lots of earth critters like termites having their way. And they were not always here for the long run. Though of course, like the classic example, the Great Wall of China has stood at least in part for many, many, many centuries. I think what these hybrids at least make explicit um, oops, sorry, I've just lost my place. Oops, give me one second. I think um, what these make explicit, though, is the kind of uh, entanglements and really the difficulties in putting together these types of experience and also the types of conditions and histories that come together there. Um, so we might think about what they can make explicit is the conditions of their time, and that's no kind of like small matter. Displacement, uncertainty and um, exposure to new conditions, risk and possibilities for reuse and reconfiguration at present in these buildings. In fact, I think even the line between what we term as round earth construction and what we call concrete is a little blurry itself. And we might think more usefully of a range of stabilised earths in the construction and that they could fully articulate the range of clays, sand, soils, rocks, dust, minerals and chemical processes that work together from brick, block um, and, and certainly to concrete and walls like this in forming the structures and surfaces we inhabit. So the move towards a more colourful architecture wouldn't simply be an aesthetic shift. Um, oops. Uh, and it would be a tangible act of decolonization and decentering of human exceptionalism. And through this, reclaiming the built environment as a space to reveal complex interactions of human and non-human geochemical experience. Um, So the dominance of pale concrete in contemporary architecture reflects a deeper cultural anxiety around colour and the privileging of whiteness in building materials is not simply an aesthetic choice but a manifestation of cultural bias uh, in building materials. A critical evaluation of these assumptions means embracing not just a wider colour palette but also engaging with diverse material expressions long chains of ecological history and experiences of dispossession, displacement and loss. And the starting point for this might be the um, meaningful consideration of all the elements that come together in this thing we call concrete. Uh, in a 2017 formation, part three, Dabba Gully, artist Megan Cope created piles of destroyed middens, which once existed on the site 
of an extraordinary concrete building, the Sydney Opera House. And the original destruction of this sacred site by white settlers was carried out to collect mounds of seafood shells for burning to create lime powder, a type of quick lime. And one such medium was located at Dava Gully, the Gadigal name for the peninsula now known as Ben Malone Point. This was the waste from important locally sourced foods built up through continuous habitation by Indigenous people occupying the area for thousands of years. And this component of cement was also essential in the construction of many Sydney's landmark colonial buildings. In her installation, Megan Cope's 12,000 handmade concrete shells were mounted on a bed of fine black ilmenite to return the lost midden back to its original location. And in that, architects could also create built environments that are inclusive, sustainable, and representative of long histories involved in specific environments. Perhaps the path there is less through sterile monotony but in articulating the colours, textures and stories still waiting to be told. Um, okay, so um, of course my thoughts on concrete are many and varied, um, but uh, for tonight's talk, I'm thinking about concrete's role as a geology of the Anthropocene, as rubble and rock and even soils in the making. Um, so my PhD, as Peter mentioned, is examining earth moving and earth making in cities such as Melbourne. And what becomes apparent is that through the construction of the settler colonial city, the topography is often smoothed out, normalised, hills are cut down, low points such as swamps are reclaimed and raised. Human-made marks on the land, such as quarries, are eventually filled with waste material, all really in the name of efficiency. So while some of this fill um, is excavated earth, a lot of it is waste, and much of that is construction rubble. So of course, estimates will vary, but as a kind of guide, currently around 38% of waste material in Australia is attributed to construction waste. Included in this mix, along with bricks, plastic, timber, etc., is of course concrete. So when concrete, amongst other garbage, arrives at landfills, it moves from being a building material to something else. It sits amongst the basalts and the sandstones, the clays and loams, and it's for this reason that it is seen by some geologists, archaeologists and geographers as a material marker of the Anthropocene, a human-made layer of the subsurface. So the thing about concrete is that even when it reaches its supposed end of um end of the supposed end of its useful life as a building, it still has historically served a purpose, a waste material that rather being dead as a second wind, if you will, as a kind of geological force. I considered the title of tonight's event and wondered um, if rather than seeing this as a eulogy to concrete, I might suggest that concrete isn't yet dead but perhaps it is going through a kind of late stage three-quarter life crisis. So the image here on the screen is of the Dudley Flats near North Melbourne, um, also known as Hood Island, um, which was the West Melbourne Swamp. Archaeological reports demonstrate the way concrete here has become a layer of the ground, as it was once an easy dumping place for the city's building rubble. What we can see is that concrete becomes a material that also reflects inequity and violences across the city. Here it was used to suffocate Melbourne's marshlands, or as Charity already discussed, um, in Melbourne's very early years, Indigenous middens and naturally occurring shell reefs were consumed in order to make colonial mortar. This was mirrored even more extensively in places such as Sydney and Tasmania where shell reefs were the main source of lime for mortar. So this is a material whose capacity to consume and smother spreads far and wide. 
You can see the... Um, in addition to volcanic explosions, naturally occurring sediment flows and deposits, etc., the ground strata, <laughs> and in this case I'm usually referring to the CC, is formed through human activities, habits and occupation. It might not be immediately apparent, but we are all what the American earth scientist Roger Hooke called geomorphic agents. That is, we are makers of all earth forms, of terrains, of topographies, geologies and rocks. Of course, this is not limited to the making of buildings. We act as geomorphic agents when we carve out waterways, when we take material to the tip or erode bitumen by driving on it. This is something that I think geographers, archaeologists and geologists have a pretty good handle on. So this is the archaeologist Matt Edgeworth's work. Um, he's examined artificial ground um, a fair bit. Um, and this is his work examining an historic and now eroding landfill in London. Edgeworth's work is interesting because it demonstrates the way sending materials such as concrete to landfill not just reflective of a kind of waste culture, but then they become something else, undermining or confusing our understandings of what is natural and not. And I wondered how our interactions with concrete might shift if we saw ourselves as not only building with it or occupying it, but instead facilitating its movement into geological cycles, or if somehow we saw the buildings we make as future fossils. So as I mentioned, we are all geological agents, but I wanted to highlight the case of Will in the Wrecker. The infamous firm Will in the Wrecker was well known for its demolition work that they carried out um, in Melbourne across the 20th century. As Whelan's demolished swathes of the city's historic precincts, the firm's wreckers referred to themselves as reverse builders. An under-examined element of Whelan's work, however, was not, in my mind, was not the capacity to demolish or reverse build, but their largely overlooked roles as substantial geological agents or actors. They used the concrete and brick rubble from jobs to remake, and perhaps we could say even repair, the scars of quarrying in suburbs of Melbourne, such as Brunswick. And it's here that we can see the odd contradictions at play where concrete is a material both requiring and providing palliative care. So once it reaches its end of life as a building, concrete achieves a new kind of mobility and vitality that might be equally complicated and troubling. This isn't a new observation, and I think the work of British geologist Robert Lionel Sherlock is particularly interesting and illuminating. In the first couple of decades of the 20th century, Robert Sherlock travelled across the UK in an attempt to calculate the impact humans had on reshaping the geologies of the United Kingdom. After years of fieldwork and a pause due to World War I, Sherlock published his text, Man as a Geological Agent, an account of his actions on inanimate nature in 1925. The date is important because Sherlock's work is startlingly relevant and pressing today. Through his work, Sherlock explored the profound impact of human activities on the Earth's geological processes. Sherlock explored the way humans from agriculture to industry significantly altered landscapes, ecosystems, and even the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. He identified humans as an increasingly powerful geological force, shaping the planet's surface and immersing themselves in the activities that mimic geological events. Using London as one of his case studies, Sherlock argued that London was rising on its own waist, accreting, he estimated, an extra foot every century. Humans not only replicated the process of natural geological forces, but Robert Sherlock identified that we made materials that also replicated naturally occurring rocks, glass, bricks, and of course, concrete, which Sherlock likened to a kind of breccia or a sedimentary rock. So on this slide, there's some excerpts from Sherlock's text, and then an image that I have borrowed from a Reddit discussion 
where Reddit contributors are discussing or debating whether the rock pictured is a chunk of concrete or a nice example of a sedimentary rock. This online discussion illustrates the ambiguity we find ourselves in, where we're unable to identify concrete from rock. Of course, rocks are the parent material of soils. Um, and if we perhaps move down in scale, it is interesting to imagine concrete structures and their future as the soil and their future as soils. The environmental anthropologist Jermaine Melman makes this quotient observation. So at the beginning of his fieldwork, I discovered that these scientists' understanding of cities as places full of soils question the common conceptual difference between soil and ground or between living and non-living compounds. When these scientists looked at them, they didn't see inert surfaces, but plants pioneering every crack, dust and organic matter forming from accumula accumulated layers in every street corner and processes of sedimentation decomposition and erosion taking place everywhere. And I think this is the key point. They regarded urban surfaces, sidewalks, gutters, parking lots, what have you, as soil in becoming. The idea of becoming links to an understanding of the world as made of processes rather than finished objects. And this understanding of concrete and bitumen surfaces also highlights the myriad of questions we might pose around concrete around its past and present usage and its extended and unpredictable futures. Um, so finally, in 2021, uh, Zosha Zivaska and Charlotte Mothed Barthes published a graphic novel, Imagining a Future, where a global moratorium on demolition and new construction has been implemented. In that publication, the authors propose new roles for workers in the built industry, um, maintaining and caring for buildings with roles such as material nurses and building surgeons. And I thought this was a good place to end because these, offers alter these offer alternatives and counterpoints to the roles already assigned to us as rock makers and geological agents. Um, and so with that, I'm going to end with the biggest rock of all, Chadston. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Peter, so much for inviting me along to uh, this panel. Uh, I'm going to spend my kind of small amount of time today talking about the chemical nature of opus kymentium or kymentium um, kind of, and, and thinking about for, kind of making an argument for why the dome of the Pantheon uh, is not made of concrete. So what appears to have been lost? Um, this was indeed lost, but was not what we think it was. I'm sure that all of you know that the, the Pantheon was constructed around 126 CE, um, and you probably have often heard of it referenced as the technological marvel, particularly with the respect to kind of the innovative usage of concrete relative to a rather massive structure for that time. This application of contemporary qualities of concrete, in particular plasticity and structural load bearing capacity, to opus kymenticium, the material that out of which the dome was actually made. It's a little bit of an inappropriate misconceptualization that kind of misses the whole point of what's happening within the context of that construction. And so what I'd like to argue tonight is that cement work, um, I'm not going to say the Latin any longer because I tend to murder Latin when I try to pronounce it, um, that materialized the dome of the Pantheon is not in fact contemporary concrete. And in fact, that the so designated, quote unquote, lost concrete technology, that was re rediscovered in the 19th century is not in fact the discovery of the same material at all. What I hope to be able to do today is to answer a series of three questions and I apologize. I'm going to try to answer them as quickly as possible. Um, the first of which is what is the chemistry of concrete and followed by what is the chemistry of 
cement work. And I will explain in a moment what that why is about in the second chemistry. Um, that task is really talking about the difference between the contemporary explanation of the Pozzolanic reaction that occurs in ancient Roman uh, concrete from a kind of contemporary perspective to perhaps the way or manner that Vitruvius would have perceived that transformation in that alchemical process. The second question that I'd really like to address, I think again briefly, is what were the metaphysical and ethical implications of cement work? This is a little bit more difficult to answer directly. So I'm going to turn to a moment in time when concrete is lost, the 12th century, um, and to the sermons of Bernard of Clairvaux, one of the fathers of the church and one of the um, most influential Cistercian monks um, of the Middle Ages, and examine his dedications on churches to understand what the wall represented and perhaps how cement factors into his understanding of both metaphysical and ethical implications of wall construction. Um, the final question and the kind of most important question to designate the difference between concrete and cement work in an ancient context is to ask ourselves how cement work was animate. Um, how did it classify as a living being? And to develop that through a better understanding of the slaking of lime as a process of material, material perfection um, and a quick line in and of itself as an alchemical or magical material. So as promised, I need to differentiate between two terms here, chemistry uh, and chemistry associated with concrete and chemistry with the Y in association with cement work. I'm borrowing chemistry with the Y from the work of Lawrence Pachimpe and Bill Newman, um, two historians of chemistry, and they developed the term or coined the term to remove the negative and backward projecting assumptions about science um, toward alchemical explanations historically occurring prior to the modern era. So it's kind of a very specific term. And within this context, chemistry with an E is the explanatory chemical um, post enlightenment understanding of materiality that only accepts materiality as being dead. And this is something that happens following uh, Antoine Lavoisier's treatise on chemistry in 1789, which effectively removes the study of movement from the study of chemistry. So if we want to look at and begin to talk about the chemistry of concrete, we get these lovely little chains of letters and numbers. Um, that can be unpacked to explain the chemical processes underlying the transformation of limestone into uh, calcium oxide, uh, the slaking of it, et cetera, uh, to kind of go through, kind of quickly through what that process is. You start with limestone, which chemically is calcium carbonate. That calcium carbonate is calcined, which means heating it for a period of time at approximately 900 degrees C. Uh, that strips or oxidizes away some of the oxygen from within the, the compound uh, and produces quicklime or calcium oxide, which is actually a fairly volatile uh, mixture. Um, so once you have once you have calcium oxide, you then slake or cover that quicklime in water to produce calcium hydroxide. Um, this produces a rather uh, vigorous uh, reaction in which there's a large amount of heat released from the process um, and that produces um, calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide in this case being kind of the fundamental binding agent within um, cement. Further to that, you add in aggregate and sand and you end up with concrete, or at least from a contemporary perspective. And I will, I will say that within the context of this kind of chain of elemental transformations, what we're talking about specifically is the chemical reaction or the set of chemical reactions that would be occurring in the kind of cement that was used in the ancient Roman era. Um, part of the reason for differentiating it is that the reaction between 
potassium hydroxide and silica or alumina um, is not always a potsilonic reaction, uh, which has to do with um, the particular form of the silica that or alumina that is added to the quicklime. If we then switch and look at uh, a Roman perspective, or an ancient Roman perspective on what concrete was, uh, we need to turn to Vitruvius and his 10 books on architecture, in particular chapter five of book two. Um, and I've edited out a lot of this for the sake of time, but what um, Vitruvius writes about the process of making cement and the incorporation of cement work into the forming of a wall, uh, follows. But when they, and in this case, uh, white stone, which is limestone or lava, are thrown into the kiln, they are seized by the violent heat of the fire and they lose the virtue. And I should note that virtue within this context or veer um, is power as well. So there's kind of this, it's, it's a, a funny term relative to its translation out of the Latin. So they lose the virtue or the power of their form or solidity. When the moisture, which is in the body of that stone and the air are burnt out and removed and the stone retains the latent, oops, sorry, that should be latent heat, not latent here, on being plunged into water, it speeds. And thus being cooled again, it rejects the heat from the substance of lime. There, when the pores and attenuations of the lime are open, it catches up into itself the mixture of the sand there it coheres, and as it dries, joins with the rubble and produces solid falling. A couple of incidents within the context, this notion of cooling and opening of the pores and the effect of air um, and wind and removal uh, of both elements relative to the uh, cement or to the lie, also is discussed relative to catharsis in the theater and the necessity of walls to protect the health of humans that are watching theater. So there's a, there's a parallel between the, the health of humans and the production of concrete, at least in terms of thinking about it as an alchemical reaction occurring within the kiln and then subsequently as it's mixed in to form a wall. If we look at early Roman concrete construction. So this example is from Pompeii from the third century BCE. Um, it isn't really what we expect when we see something like uh, the Dome of the Pantheon. And the, but the reality is if you look closely at the Dome of the Pantheon, you'll see some of the characteristics that I'm going to begin to point out. What we should note here is that the cement and the cement work really is more of a binding agent for the rubble. Should also kind of talk about the kind of mixture that's happening relative to the production of that cement that feeds into this cement work and the making of a wall. It is a heterogeneous mixture. Um, the form of quicklime would be uh, of pebbles or random shapes that would not be ground into a fine powder. And this means, and so, in some cases, it would not be hydrated. So it would not be slaked, which means that the kind of potsilonic reaction would not necessarily occur during the construction of the wall or would only partially occur. Um, and this will come back um, at the end of my little conversation about cement work. Um, so this doesn't look like contemporary concrete and in fact is not um, like contemporary concrete, even if it is in terms of a contemporary understanding of chemistry, similar. Um, a significantly later version of the same use of concrete. In this case, uh, it is a wall at Ossian Antica from 42. CE, and this is one of the more common ways of using concrete or cement work uh, in the Roman context. In this case, it becomes the infill material along with additional plate rubble between um, widths of masonry. Um, so kind of, again, an infill material. And the thing to kind of think about within this context, and we can kind of look at it with a, again, a first century example from a city wall in Spain, the the concrete the cement work is not poured cement. It is not 
form finding in that sense. Um, form work would have been used in the case of, of this particular wall for the area above uh, the stone. However, it would be laid in layers. So the bedding of cement work is very much in parallel to the bedding of the masonry in and of itself. So it moves up in those kind of lips in the same sort of way. Part of this is, is in response to the, the labor required to produce quicklime and the lifespan of the quicklime that would make, that would kind of allow the material to cure. There was no way of producing enough quicklime and mixing it with sand and aggregate or pozzolano pots, and aggregate to produce that in sufficient quantities to actually be able to pour it. Um, so the mixtures were heterogeneous. Again, they had different kind of clumps of quicklime within them that um, interact with other materials in kind of particular ways that do not behave in the same way as a contemporary concrete mixture would, would work. Um, and they're not, and they're not, it's not something in which the, the cement work can take on any shape uh, without a great deal of effort. So in chemical terms, there are some ways in which we can kind of explain what cement work is and to compare cement work to contemporary formulations of concrete. And again, we'll speak kind of towards the end, get back to some of these conversations relative or these kind of discoveries um, in which quote unquote ancient techniques provide new approaches to concrete today. However, again, it's a very kind of strange a material misconception that's happening within the context of the translation of what's happening in this wall and what's happening, for example, in Ando's in pavilion walls. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and try to understand precisely why the cement work would have been conceptualized differently relative to the production of a wall than our contemporary understanding. So we already know that the kind of the way that the material forms and the way the material behaves would have been different from our expectations relative to contemporary concrete. And this is where I want to turn to Bernard de Clairvaux in the middle of the 12th century, and particularly in 12th century France, um, in part because I, it's one of the people that I study, but also because Bernard makes this strange association between his community of monks and the construction of a wall and the qualities of that wall and why the qualities of that wall might be a more perfect state, both for his monks and for the material that makes up the wall. So Bernard wrote five sermons on the dedications of the church in the middle of the, the 12th century. Broadly across those sermons, the argument that he makes is that the dedication of the church brings together and assembles and orders the brothers and monks of the community in such a way that they become living stones and thereby complete or finish the walls of the physical church. So the church, the physical church walls and the bodies of the men that enter into the church are the same or related materialities and come to a perfection when they are ordered in the proper way together. Now, the thing that's interesting within the context of the way that he describes this transformation of dead monks and dead monk and dead, dead stones into living stones is through a mixed metaphor that is perhaps unexpected from our contemporary perspective. He talks about soldering the wall together. So he uses mixed, mixed masonry and metallurgy or metalworking metaphors to describe the completion and perfection of the wall of the church and his um, community. Um, so for example, we read in Isaiah, solder is good. The stones therefore are joined by these two. They are soldered with full knowledge and perfect love. A little bit later on, continuing the metaphor, the coppersmith striking with the hammer encouraged him that forge at the time saying, it is ready for soldering and he strengthened it with nails that it should not be moved. Now, later in the, the same sermon, he will compare the finished wall and the polishing of the finished wall to a transformation of the wall into gold. So the idea that the masonry comes together, and the, the word that he's using here, so the word that 
the verb glutina might be translated uh, to glue. Um, it is often in the English translations that are available today, translated literally as cemented, but within the context and the, the kind of the remainder of the, the metal metaphors and metal working metaphors that are happening over the sermons, soldering or perhaps welding are more important. Um, and ultimately what this is doing is transforming the wall of the church into something that is monolithic and has no seams or joints. Um, Bernard describes this process at, at the end as a whitewashing of the wall that occurs through the touch of divinity. Uh, um, now, this is interesting because that same kind of metaphor is expanded upon Peter by Peter of Stel in his treatise on conscious, which is also from the 12th century. Peter Zell was another Cistercian. He also happened to be the abbot of Reims. Um, but in, in the treatise on conscious, Peter describes the perfection of the monk as the building of a wall. And within that context, over time, the, the wall that is the monk transforms from a wall of iron to a wall of brick to a wall of gold. So this kind of same material transformation that slips back and forth between masonry and metal happens relative to the monk um, himself. Now, but Peter warns that one should take care within the context of one's artisanship, because if one takes too much pride in one's knowledge and one's mastery of craft, one falls victim to the mortal sin of pride, thereby falling from the grace of God and kind of defeating the whole purpose of perfecting oneself. Um, and so this is kind of interesting within that context. And he, one of the solutions or the kind of material solution when he describes this kind of metaphorically describes the transformation of the monk as the building of a wall, the final step over that gold and that perfectly soldered together surface or that perfectly jointed masonry wall is to repaint the joint lines and to paint joint lines that are not perfect. And by doing so, act humbly relative to one's own work. Um, now, what's interesting within that context is that so we can the image uh, on the screen at the moment is the chapter house at Kirkstall Abbey, which was established around 1125 CE um, and is in present day Leeds. In that chapter house, the little inset image, which apologize, it's really difficult to photograph these. There are painted joint lines over the masonry of the chapter house that do not match the underlying joint work of the physical stones and, right? So that notion of humility within the context of a metaphor that applied to a human being and a human being's transformation was enacted through and um, through and in the construction of the church in and of itself. The other thing to note within the context of the chapter house is that the monks literally became part of the chapter house and around the perimeter of the external wall are several locations where former habits of the monastery were immured in those walls. So the dead literally built up that living wall. Jason, I need to give you the gentle nudge. Okay, I can go through really quickly. So I've got my last little section, which is the kind of, so what's happening within the context and what does this suggest about the materiality of that wall and the kind of perfection of that materiality? Um, so I have two images at the moment here. One is of Iceland spar, calcium carbonate. The other of limestone, calcium carbonate. Um, in the Middle Ages and in the ancient world, Iceland spar, the particular form of calcium carbonate was a magical stone in that it could allow one to see the sun when it dipped below the horizon. Limestone being white um, was perceived to be somewhat perfect, but had to undergo a chemical transformation, an alchemical transformation that allowed it to produce its own change. And the thing that we need to take note of within the context of this kind of critical ingredient of cement work is that the material here 
has its own agency. It wants to be something else. And we get a sense of this, or there's a resonance of this in the vocabulary that surrounds quicklime and quicklime slaking still today. So when things go right, wrong, you have deadline or drowned line, or in a lapsarian sense, fallen line. So ethically, line can go awry. That leads me to my conclusions. We kind of tie in back to our contemporary um, concrete so more recently, and I mentioned this ahead of time, that you have these kind of clasps of um, quicklime in Roman construction. What has been discovered recently is that as water penetrates ancient cement work, it does activate the, the some of those remainders of unslaked quicklime within the wall causing it to bubble and surge out, infilling cracks and, quote, repairing the wall. And although that now gets described as a future potential of concrete, and particularly relative to the idea of bioconcrete, that notion of a material that can change itself into something better, that process which is happening when those little remainders of quicklime are hydrated in ancient walls does not and will not happen in the future of concrete. All right. <clears throat> um, well, thank you, Jason, for that exquisite narrative on the history of concrete and um i think we're ready for um questions from the audience but i might ask each of you because each of you have approached this um particular topic in a way that um is different to what we might expect because i think at other in other venues we might just hear about the technic the technicalities of um uh, working out how much embodied carbon might be in a in a building or something like that, which I guess we've covered a little bit, but I'm I'm keen to hear maybe starting with you, um, Charity, you know these sort of different aesthetic insights or um, architectural theory insights, or you know the narrative that Jason has um, um, presented to us. How do you think that? elucidates our current dilemma of not wanting to use concrete or, or embody carbon emissions in concrete. That's oh, right. And your slides are in the chat now. Wow. Great. And Charity, your slides are in the chat. <laughs> Everyone's going to be very excited, especially so the queer sense. geology and quarry quarry group. Um, anyway, um, that was a I bit of a long-winded so say, I Go feel vindicated as well because there was also a photo of self-healing concrete in there. So it would have tied in so nicely with the final <clears> point and the full circularity of these arguments. Because I would have said, Peter, that I think they're all exactly the same that we're talking about, even though you think they're quite different. I think they're all concerned with concrete in its socio-material sense, right? That's not just an object. It's not just a thing that's built, but there are, incredibly complicated and in like long histories of cultural, theological, mm. spiritual, geological meaning attached to these things that we work with. Um, so it's, you know, I know from like past discussions with Jason, he has some impatience with entanglement and kind of like Haraway and people like that because I just hope I'm not treading on toes here, but you would say that there's like much longer kind of discussions of these sorts of ideas and that's been present um there's not just a sixty-five thousand year ago history of these things and a colonial modern one that's a much mm. longer many thousands of years mm. and mm. material practice and reflection on that and what that means for each of us and the worlds that we live in so i would say that all three are kind of thinking about what does concrete mean in these contexts and how it's not divorced from where it came from or where it's going i don't know Maybe I'm speaking. Well, to I you. think yeah, no, I think yeah, I think dealing with it as a social, what is it, socio-material um, artifact or I suppose 
situation is probably maybe is one way to help us um, decarbonise. I mean, surely decarbonisation in relation to concrete or other materials isn't simply about the technical. Yeah. And, it, 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 you know, we do need to consider these other broader things. And I think in my poem, um, I was trying to be like particles of concrete, like I was trying to be the atoms of concrete, which is a different way of kind of like a kind of swarm, a different way of thinking about materials and materiality rather than just thinking about them as objects. What do you think about these issues, Virginia? <clears throat> yeah, I definitely think that um, charity is on point um, there and this, I forget what, uh, what, what did you call it, charity? Socio... Socio material concerns. I don't know. Jason will have a better term for it that's actually like rigorous. Yeah, and I think it was interesting that we both um were referring to, for example, the shell middens and their their role in this and Megan Cope's word. Um which is was... the line as well that Jason yeah. talked about and the agency of that kind of material. And the shell middens are the result of um, you know, I suppose well, ritual practices in a way, like, you know, social and material practices and maybe rituals of eating and rituals of being in a particular place and connected to a particular place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, may, maybe that's the problem with Ando's Pavilion because it's just been plonked. I said plopped in the poem yeah. down, and it and it and it and it kind of it's con it's no there's no connection to the place, in the sense that the only connections to that context in those gardens are read or interpreted in sort of big picture eternal ways, mm. and I think when I was thinking about it, it's not very far from the um, indigenous rock monument, which um, is just probably, what, within a couple of hundred metres or a hundred metres facing the Yarra. So there's no sense of um, that kind of context in that building. I mean, it really is a kind of import. Anyway, Jason, what do you, we'll have audience questions after you. <laughs> yeah, no. I, look, I, I mean, we spoke on the phone today and you were talking about the alchemical and I thought that was a pretty cool sort of thing for us to think about. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like a chemical is, a, is, a, is an attempt to remove, uh, so chemical with a Y, isn't it? It's kind of friendship based kind of attempt to remove the baggage of the alchemical from a contemporary perspective, because kind of obviously it's, it's, it has these negative associations that really belie the, the sophistication of thought that, you know, went into um, kind of thinking about craft and kind of what happens within the context of, kind of making materials um, pre-enlightenment and kind of you know, cross-culturally um, as well. So I think there's there's something to kind of say there. I think there's also something, and, and you know, and I think, and this was kind of the, me cutting things away to kind of almost do something on time. Um, this, you know, I think the problem the problem with Ande. Because the, some of those some of those kind of goals relative to the kind of the quotes that you that you presented there probably don't sound all that similar from the the kind of um, metaphysical goals of you know the the Masons associated with Bernard or with Sujet or mm, with mm, Victor, mm. right? But I think that but the, but the but it, I think it's a little bit it's a little bit disingenuous from a material perspective. The you know so we can talk about the place and the transformation of the place, but it's the remaking of the material condition that gets lost within that context and any agency that inheres in that material condition and what changes. And the, the I, I have I have a host of problems <laughs> with with the theology for for obvious reasons. But if, when you begin, if you can attempt to kind of strip out or secularize um, some of the thought from the 12th century, kind of interesting things. Kind of start to creep up within that context. So for example, Hugh of St. Victor, and I'm going to edit or edit a paraphrase of Hugh of St. Victor. Hugh of St. Victor said that people exist to make the world beautiful. And by making the world beautiful, they make themselves happy and beautiful. 
Um, and so this this notion that you know what we're doing, and we can we can talk about it as pastoral, and we can kind of talk about all the the kind of theological problems, but this kind of the the that necessity of treating the material condition as if it is an equivalent being to yourself, and thereby transform it into something that also makes you better, I think has to kind of factor into the equation. And that doesn't exist within the kind of the, the cold glossiness of endo surfaces, which yes, they're exquisitely mm. crafted, but as you say in your poem, they're wrought with a lot of violence. Um, and that, mm. that kind of mm. that kind of material transformation is not unique. It's not it's not uniquely Western. And it kind of also shows up in um, the the transformation of the early um, Tibetan religions um, into Bon and to Tibetan Buddhism, where kind of architectural transformation of the world is what leads to enlightenment for Milarepa. Okay, that is truly amazing, Jason. And um, when I when we put these things together, we never know where they're going to end up. But here we are. Um, are there any questions from the um, audience? I think if you want to ask a question, pop your hand up. And, and while people gather their thoughts, would you like to respond that your um, your poem is a roast? You're on mute. <laughs> What's that? I didn't quite catch that. So in the chat, there's a reflection on your um, poetic roast. Would you like to respond to the fact that it's a roast? I, ha I haven't seen it. <laughs> or do we have a question? Oh, we have a question from Rebecca. We have a question. Yeah, so the, um, the, the quote um, of... To... <laughs> And I'm, I'm paraphrasing a lot and kind of editing quite a bit to kind of strip out the religion from it. But um, it's Hugh of St. Victor, um, who was an August, a 12th century Augustinian canon um, just outside of Paris at the time. And, and Hugh is extremely Boy. interesting and very much responsible for a large part of how contemporary education in universities um, occurs um, and is... is um, quite well known for his um, writing on exegetical practices and how they happen, that sort of thing. Um, he also may have been a painter um, and used painting as uh, a mystical, uh, a process of mystical ascent. So there's some really interesting things about you. Um, and he factors quite strongly in, in the book that I've written. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I think the concrete poem is a savage um roast critique of Ando's pavilion. I mean, I think I just got sick of seeing, I mean, they're having, it's about to be finished. They're having a final party. What's your, what's your Insta post to see how many people go down there and enjoy the party and post stuff up onto Insta and say how great it is. So, I, you know, I, I think some of the things we've spoken about tonight, um, uh, Tony has asked, a uh, Tony has asked us a question about how many more tons of carbon to demolish the pavilion and when. We don't really know. I mean, those of us have been watching the space. Um, one suggestion earlier in the in the M Pavilion program was it was going to stay there forever. Um, another suggestion has been that they're going to reuse the aluminium bits, um, which is really the sort of canopy and the rest is somehow going to be recycled. But uh, I think there's been a little bit of vagueness about exactly what is going to happen uh, with the pavilion. Interestingly, um, Tony, when we did the um, embodied carbon calculation, which is just basically off a bill of quantities, and we haven't spoken about it to d here tonight, the aluminium was actually quite a big component of the overall... Um, of the overall embodied carbon in the pavilion and the 116 tonnes of carbon dioxide was basically the concrete. And we prudently underestimated that because we didn't estimate, um, uh, you know, stuff for reinforcement. And, and we estimated that concrete 
as having 30% of fly ash. So it's kind of a prudent, prudent one. So we don't know. And some of us were saying we should get a couple of air tags and if they do demolish the panels and stick them on the panels and see where they go. Um, a couple of other people in ACAN said we could go down there and have, have the actual mock funeral as it's demolished. And other people were suggesting that I would um, um, chain my electric powered wheelchair to the panels <laughs> before well, it's demolished. Yeah, but, I don't there's, know. Um... I've petitioned the rumours that um, it's got a three-month reprieve and that Sean's been asked to design a gate. Okay. I mean, well, but the other thing that we can kind of throw out there and we can think about with respect to it in particular, um, if, we, if we avoid placing ourselves at the centre of the conversation and look at it on a geological timescale, um, that concrete, which I'm assuming is steel reinforced, will have an exceptionally short lifespan. Um, it will last about 25 years before it starts to seriously degrade mm. as it, the seal inside of it rusts and causes it to crack and self-disrupt. Um, so, you know, that it's just, I mean, you know, even from a, so if we, if we look at it from time scale perspective, it's a terrible material. And I think the interesting thing, the embodied carbon that has already gone into the atmosphere as a result of its making will stay there for a lot longer than the 25 years um, or potential 25 years before the concrete starts to degrade. So I think that's a good point. Um, do we have any other questions? I was going to say, there's any also question? a, um, a, oh, like a sneak alert. I don't know if every anyone is subscribed to Memo Review, which comes out of Melbourne and is an art review. There's also an architectural component of that. But they sometimes publish reviews, and I've heard that potentially something about in Pavilion is coming out very soon as yeah. well. That might be. A good I thing. think Paul Paul Walker wrote something in um, Architecture AU, which I think is a pretty kind of impartial, not quite impartial, but I think that's worth reading. Francesca, a question, hand yes, up. Yes, hello. Hello. Um, How's it going? Um, just wanted going to say. All right. Well, we're still here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to say they were all just really, really interesting aspects of, um, I guess, the life and death of concrete. Um, and I guess what really struck me was the fact that they all seemed very, um, I guess, I guess, positive about what concrete um, has to offer. As you know, I think when we talk about um, you know, the role of concrete moving forward, um, we do, I think, tend to demonise it. And I think this was a really interesting spin on that kind of offering so many other things that concrete has to offer aside from the fact that it is very carbon producing um, and has a lot of negative elements. And I guess, you know, the conversation around concrete not being a positive thing it does often feel like that demonization doesn't really move anything forward. People aren't really listening to it. Um, and I guess I was kind of wondering with these, you know, more, I don't know, like, um, you know, these like adjacent kind of views, um, do any of the speakers feel that there is like, is there something more that can be done with these um, alternative views of what concrete has to offer in pushing that dial forward um, and maybe getting more action and getting it out of production as opposed to just saying it's bad and it produces lots of carbon and waste and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah that's a good question because I'm a demonizer. So very keen to hear what um, the panel the panel thinks about that. Yeah, Does I mean, anyone want to start? <laughs> Uh, Anyone, were, I mean, I think if one of you address it, it'd be good because I'm conscious of the time. I, I have two thoughts. I mean, one is kind of the, the I think it, it goes back to the time issue. Um, designing for 25 years or 50 years as a goal is problematic. So if you want to think about the capacity of the material to offset what it's doing to the environment, then you need to think about much longer timescales um, relative to 
the lifespan of the material. And obviously there are ways in which that can work with concrete. I think the second thing that needs to happen within the context of concrete, and this is, and it, this is interesting relative to both Virginia and Charity's comments about it, most of which, like, and that the discussion that they're, that they're having largely originates in the 1950s kind of, and coincides with um, the introduction of plastics and the conceptualization of plasticity um, and so, so concrete as a plastic material needs to stop. That plasticity has serious, is a serious ontological detriment because what it means is that we are always forced to be in a state of becoming. And that applies not only to the material and the form with which that material might take, but also to ourselves psychologically and physically. So we cannot accept any kind of stasis or fixity for ourselves. And we have no agency with respect to that. And we really need to rethink that notion of plasticity. plasticity. Yeah. And obviously there's I think some that's, conversation. Yeah. I think that's a very good point. Um, Anza Boudou. Hi. Uh, um, your name properly? Uh, yeah, hi from, actually from Kirkstall in Leeds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> good to see the Abbey. Uh, it was good to see the Abbey. I'm walking past it in a couple of hours on my way to the doctor. Anyway, it's not about that. Um, um, so we we kind of had as a prompt for this a uh, structure of kind of, I guess, very dubious functionality. Um, but coming back to kind of, you know, our, I guess, sort of our primary use of concrete in the world as, as, a, as a structural material that we often expect to be around for a very long time. Um, and this almost coming back to uh, like Virginia's uh, thing of like, uh, you know, man is a geological agent and this sort of geologicalness. Um, I thought that was very interesting because maybe it's a different way of approaching how we use concrete. And I'm just it just sort of prompts in my mind is is there a way to kind of bring that out and change the way that we think about concrete as a material and its longevity or otherwise i'm thinking of things like um infrastructure use where it may be invisible to us rather than you know like a a, a, a nice sort of white visible thing that we we want to be pristine or not um, as Charity said, and and how we think about the fact we use a lot of it in invisible ways. Um, yeah, if you've got any kind of thoughts on how we might change our thinking and how we get to use the material and how we how we think about it and what happens after its life. It could be one for Virginia, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of difficult question and maybe charity's got answers or maybe it's one for charity sorry visibility. <laughs> i mean because i'm not a practitioner so i kind of feel a little bit like i can wave wag my finger at people and uh talk about how terrible it is without actually doing anything about it so charity is the practitioner um but i also like to like blame others um, yeah. for everything that i do as well i like <laughs> Very much uh, dying. Well, we are architects after all. That's right. So it is. It is always someone else's fault. Um, I'm dyed in the wool Gen X, so I'm much less hopeful than I think many other people in the audience are. And I think we've done so much damage already, right, that it's, um, it's already baked in. There's going to be not a lot to actually that's left to do so to rescue us from this situation. So I would always think that, we're more in a condition of triage um, at the point. And, and what can we do to kind of like sustain some things as long as we can with the mess that we've already made? Um, but in saying that, like the infrastructure thing is a really, I think, interesting aspect of that because we rely on these massive infrastructures as public goods, as really common goods to supply water, to supply heat, to supply all these things which aren't left to the market traditionally, although they are in some areas. Um, but there's a really interesting book uh, published recently by Deborah Cha, who talks about, and she's a um, professor of engineering in the States. She talks about like what is infrastructure used for and how do we use it now? And one of the things she talks about in that book is how we're all reliant on 19th century infrastructure at the moment. And it's really starting to degrade and fail under conditions of climate change, right? Because it was never 
assumed that the temperature everywhere would be rising so quickly or that clay pipes underground would be flooded so often and start to degrade so quickly. And so we're in this situation where we're needing to either, you know, replace or repair or, or somehow think of what we can put in instead as all these systems are failing around us, right? But the problem is that the rate of change in climate and planetary processes is now speeding up so much is how do we even imagine what will be useful in 10 years, let alone the 25 that Jason's talking about where these uh, pavilions will start to fall down because of the, the poor quality of the material and construction used anyway. So A, I know that didn't answer your question. And B, I'm sorry to have said it as a kind of like concluding moment of doom. Um, but see why my kind of research and what I try and investigate when I'm working with students as well in architecture is just thinking maybe the most we can do is really pay careful and close attention to the things that we say that we're doing, but also the ways in which we operate that might call those ambitions into question. There might be more contradictory things actually going on. Not helpful at all. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. We kind of finish there because um, we've been going for 90 minutes almost so I think that's enough I'd like to thank um, Charity and Virginia and Jason for coming along to this first ACAN event I think it's been a fascinating discussion and I think um, Francesca's question has made me think a little bit about um, a couple of things um, rather than demonizing co concrete but I think the socio-material aspects of concrete and talking through materials in those um, ways and those kinds of narratives, I think might help us um, get out of the morass that we seem to be heading into um, rather than just few purely technical discussions. Now, I think big round of applause for our um, uh, panelists. Thank you so much, Gracie and uh, Rob and other members of the, and Leone other members of the ACAN steering group for, and I think Lucy Humphrey um, thought of the idea of um, concrete eulogies and our newsletter will come out in the next week or so. So keep an eye out for that. Please subscribe to that on our website. If you don't already, you can also um, join us on Insta and our next um, event online, which is, um, will probably be just as much fun as this one, is on uh, Tuesday, May 26th. Um, and we'll be talking about issues around custodianship. So it'll be a similar similar style, fun event, probably the best thing you can do, 90 minutes on a Tuesday night. And um, thank you so much. And we'll see you around. And do subscribe to the newsletter and um, add us to follow, follow us on Instagram. So thank you, everyone. Thanks.